And right now, I've got two members of NoFX joining me here in San Francisco, lead singer and songwriter Fat Mike. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. And from a studio in L.A., NoFX drummer Eric Sandin, known uh, to most simply as Smelly. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of rock memoirs out there, but not many that are this honest, uh, in my opinion. Mike, what were the ground rules uh, going into this book? Well, uh, in order to make a book that's different to, uh, I mean, I always like to do something different. We just had a meeting and, and I told the band, I go, we have to give it all, no secrets. And if we want to make a book that's better than the average book, you know, Motley Crude's The Dirt was kind of the model for this. Okay. And I thought, man, our stories are so much better than this book because if we tell the truth and if we tell what really happened and everyone was game, especially mm-hmm. Smelly, because Smelly told stuff that uh, he, he had always told us he would never tell. Huh. It's. It, I mean, I, Smelly, it, it's, tough for, it. It, it's tough for some people to recall what happened last week, but you, you're looking back at things that happened... Uh, Decades ago, as Mike said, stuff that you, you thought you'd never say. What was it like uh, going through those memories and putting it putting it down? Well, first off, uh, there's a lot more stuff that I couldn't remember. I mean, I'm sure there's way gnarlier stuff, but I, you know, I was in a haze for, for quite a few years. So this is just stuff that I do remember, you know, and, and how it was. It was, it was pretty hard at times and, and pretty draining at times. But I had dealt with a lot of a lot of my issues and a lot of the stuff that I had done already through recovery, you know, because I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. But it's also now that it's out there, I feel really vulnerable, and it, and it's pretty weird having my uh, all my skeletons out there for people to know. Why Why did you want to do it then? If uh, you kind of felt like this will put you in a vulnerable vulnerable position. I didn't realize how vulnerable I'd feel afterward. I mean, mm. I really didn't do it. Like I was just telling my story that I've told before to, to close friends and, and to other stuff. And I also told a lot of private stuff. But I realized how vulnerable I am now emotionally and, and how I just opened up my my closet or my, or, and my heart when fans started talking to me about stuff that's so personal to me. You know, yeah. like, oh, I relate when you did this or when that happened to you. And it really kind of, set me back at first and, and I was kind of uneasy with it because I didn't expect that. And now, now, I'm, uh, now I'm better with it. So it, it was an unexpected thing to feel this vulnerable. Hmm. Uh, well, the story is told uh, from each band member separately. So there's moments where you're actually revealing things to each other uh, for the first time. Mike, was there any particular surprise for you when you're reading the stories? Well, none of us knew about Eric Melvin being molested when he was a kid. And that, you know, that comes really early in the book, and that's one of the most uncomfortable things in the book. But uh, I, I thought the most, not surprising for me, but Eric Melvin's ex-girlfriend about 25 years ago was raped by Smelly's best friend, who was a gangster. And, and she wanted us not to tell Eric Melvin because the gangster would have killed him probably. Wow. Yeah, so that, that was... was gnarly. The, guy, the guy was not afraid of killing people. Yeah, he, he was a murderer. And uh, so we never told Eric Melvin, and he found out while reading the book. So that was that a that's that that's old girlfriend was raped, and that was a section that uh, the the story that you told Mike, but the whole band knew that except for Eric Melvin. Smelly knew it too. Yeah, but we, we knew we couldn't tell him because he would have he would have gone after the guy or done something. The guy ended up doing how many how many years did he do Smelly? Well, he's in he's in prison for life right now. But but right after that, he, he did twelve years. Got out for about a year, did another seven years, got out for for a year, and then now he's in for life. <laughs> yeah, wow. these are the kind of people we were hanging out with. And Yeah, these are my best friends. And that's why this nice book is, is important. People, yeah, nice, people think of No Effects as, you know, a 90s fun skate band from California. And the 80s were not that at all. The 80s were, it was, uh, it was I, very I, dangerous I, when I we grew up. Everyone who reads this book thinks of us completely differently now. I want to get into the violence of that era because there is a lot of that uh, in the book. But what was uh, Eric Melvin's reaction to that story? Yeah, I I talked to him right right afterwards, and he wasn't. She told him that that he that he uh, that she was attacked by this guy, but that she got away. So he he kind of knew, and he just he didn't want to think about it really. It was a bad time for all of us. I mean, this one guy terrified our whole scene. Yeah. And well, pretty much a whole town, to, too. Yeah, he he would come up to people and just knock them out. You know, they wouldn't see it coming. 
to sucker punch people. Give us a, give us some context. Uh, Smelly, you said this was like your best friend. Yeah, he was. He was some guy. I remember the first time I saw him, he was walking up the street. And he, I mean, this is, the first time I saw him was in 85 probably. And uh, he was walking up the street and I was like, Jesus Christ, that guy's gnarly. You know, back then, nobody had tattoos on their necks or on their face, sleeved arms, you know. And he just looked like uh, just pure evil. And for some reason, I don't know, I was like, you know what? I got to get on that guy's good side and not his bad side because we hung around in the same group of people. And uh, he introduced me to a life of drugs, uh, robbery, you know, just all kinds of crazy shit that... He he gave you your first heroin, Smelly. Yeah, he did. He shot me up for the first time. And he said, as he's... As the heroin's being pushed into my vein, he said, welcome to hell. You know, with this like weird kind of like a little bit of joy in his voice kind of. Wow. And yeah, it was weird. You know, my whole life I've always been kind of attracted to dark and edgy and, um, you know, subcultury kind of things, counterculture stuff. That's why we all got into right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was just, that was part of the extension of it, you know, but mm-hmm. then it just turned out him and I really actually hit it off. And he was able to drop that facade of being this crazy, out of control murderer. I mean, that he was, and we got to know each other as as friends. But that doesn't mean yeah. that that if if I was to piss him off, he wouldn't try and kill me. So I always had that in the back of my head. So many so many questions that coming out of that. But Mike, you said that the violence in the scene has been a big surprise to a lot of your fans. Right. Well, well pe- I mean. Well, because punk rock isn't violent now. You know, there's security guards at shows, there's barricades. Uh, the shows are at nice clubs, but back then there was nothing like that. And well, what were, was going on back and, then? Why were things so dangerous? It, I don't know why, but it was L.A. in particular. Because I'd, you know, I'd seen, I'd gone to San Francisco and been to other cities. But L.A., they were just, they were L.A. gangs. And gangsters found out that you could go to punk shows and just beat the hell out of anyone you wanted to, and there's no one to, that was going to stop you. Wow. So really, every five or ten minutes, someone is getting rat-packed, and someone is getting dragged out of the club. And there weren't ambulances back then. You just, I mean, like, it, that's just how it was. And that's why I ended up leaving L.A. You know, my friend got stabbed in the lung at a Dickey show. It just just could have just as easily been me. And another one of my friends got smashed in the face with a bottle and knocked all his teeth out. And these are just random you know, these are. This is not for some vendetta. Mm-hmm. This is just let's get that guy. So it was just random violence, random senseless violence, which is you know kind of what what Smelly said is that's we were you know sixteen, seventeen years old, and it's that's what that's what kind of drew us to these to these shows. It wasn't just the music; it was that you didn't know what was going to happen next. Yeah, it was so volatile. It was it was like it was like a, a bomb waiting to explode at any time. And that was exciting in its own. Mm. Smell, you and said there were cops, and cops yeah. would 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 they would come to shows and, and beat the hell out of kids too. So, mayhem. Really, it really is amazing that that the four the three of us got out of there without without anything really. Smelly, you said you you gravitated to to characters like this uh, big gangster. Why do you think that was? I mean, you talked about partly the the sense of excitement around. No, around I kind of know why. It, yeah. I kind of know why I was when when I grew up. I kind of felt weak and and intimidated and uh, insecure about myself, you know, because uh, uh, you know my household wasn't the best household, and um, and it was a way for me to put a front up that if I hung out with these kind of people, people wouldn't see me that way, you know. Mm-hmm. So my whole life, like I lived in a neighborhood, there was a lot of bikers and stuff like that, and I was like, oh, these guys are tough, these guys are hard, they don't feel the way I feel. But they all probably do. You know, that's why they have it. That's why they do what they do. So what I did was kind of surround myself with those kind of people to mask my true feelings. You guys are both uh, very candid about the violence that went on. Mike, you saw more than riots and violence at shows. You write about uh, being witness to sexual assault. And, and many of you reveal stories about friends uh, being raped. I mean, a lot of people would ask, why stick uh, in that scene? Well, it's you know it's punk rock. It's a music scene, and you know, uh, stuff happens. It just it's just weird how uh, it was 
people it just happened so much and what do you I mean, what are you supposed to do mm -hmm. the time that happened the one particular time you're talking about me and eric melvin were in uh compton it, we we're in a really bad neighborhood and you know cops would not come to shows there's no way cops were going to come and there was a gang there and two of the gang members uh were about to sexually assault a girl and you know uh we saw them take this girl down these stairs and it was you know it still haunts us to this day we put it in the book because that's what it was like then. And, you know, the, the two gangsters looked at me and Eric, and we were 16 years old. And they said, you didn't see a thing. You didn't see and those kind of thing. guys were Those kind of guys were freaking scary and intimidating. Yeah. And there was, there you know, was your 25, question was, of the, 25 of the dudes in the gang were there. That's so, kind of know, an impossible situation. Yeah. It's an impossible yeah, situation. You, we, we, we could have driven away real quick. You know, found a payphone and called the cops who wouldn't have came, and then we would have been on their list. Well, as you guys have been alluding to, a big theme that keeps coming up in Hepatitis Bathtub is survival. Uh, the band is, has persevered as a punk rock success story. Uh, you guys have personally uh, survived. But your early years uh, didn't necessarily appear to be super promising musically. Smelly, what uh, did the earliest incarnations of NoFX sound like? He changed oh, the man. subject. I mean, Sibylla, it was getting too gnarly. Well, I, I want to just, he I want to get back. I want to get back to all that stuff. I really, I, and, and we will no, get no, back to not, all that. Let's not but, bring it back up because I'm, I'm creeped out now talking about it. Exactly. I, I really yeah. don't like talking I, about it. Yeah. I kind of want to lighten the mood for a second. I, I mean, you guys give some funny descriptions of, of the earliest uh, incarnations of, of no effects. Uh, Smelly, what do you well, remember of, of your earliest sound? I was playing in a band prior to, prior to No Effects, a band called Costa Cause, and all these dudes were older. They were really good musicians, and uh, the songs were actually pretty good. But I couldn't relate to them. They were they were in their thirties, and I was with when I was playing with them, I was like fifteen and sixteen, and I couldn't relate to them. You know, we weren't on the same level. So when I started hanging out with 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 Melvin and Mike, and I started playing with them, the music was fucking horrible. Excuse my language. <laughs> the music was horrible. But I was having more fun hanging out with these guys because they're my my bros, you know. So my drumming went got really bad for a while. It was really good when I was playing with the with the guys that were good, and then when I started playing with these guys with no effects, it got really bad because the mus musicianship wasn't there. But I was having a lot of fun with hanging out with my buds. So for me, it wasn't so much about the music; it was more about just hanging out, you know. With with the with the uh, Melvin and Mike, Mike, you're not. Uh, I don't hear. I don't hear you punk, denying uh, the, any of those descriptions of your musicianship. How, how did you? Oh feel? no, and it went on for years and years and years. You know, I mean, it, we didn't become uh, a mediocre band for about eight or nine years. <laughs> when we reached me mediocrity, <laughs> that was that was a real milestone in our career. <laughs> you said it was. It, you said it was genuine delusion that kept you going, Mike. You you thought you guys were great at the time. Well, every band thinks they're great. I know from owning a record label, every band thinks they just made their best album and they all think they're great. <laughs> and I look back at these shows where I actually thought, man, we're the best band here tonight. And you look and wow, all the other bands were actually much better than us. Looking back. <laughs> and and, uh, and Smell, you, you stuck just... around because of the camaraderie. Yeah, man, it was fun. There was, there was two other dudes my age. We were playing shows all the time at the clubs that I was hanging out with all the, I mean, hanging out at all the time with people that I knew from hanging out at those clubs. It was like a, uh, it was just a really good time. You know, I mean, yes, there was violence. Yes, there was all this crazy stuff around it, but it was ours. Mm -hmm. You know, we had our our place in it, you know. So it was, it was um, some of the best times of my life, for sure. And you didn't have to be a musician to be in punk rock. That's the best thing about punk rock. It's the only style of music that you really don't know. You don't need any uh, knowledge of music. And you could be in a, a huge famous band by not knowing how to do anything. Mike, uh, when do you you said around eight or nine years you guys hit mediocre? What was that point? <laughs> what's that? What's that point where you feel like we we were a competent band? When you look back, uh, well, when we made S and M Airlines, that was when I learned how to kind of figure out how to write songs, but I couldn't sing in pitch at all. So you listen to that record and, and you hear the songs. Oh, this is a pretty good song. And then I start singing, and then ooh. You know, uh, it's a real tough listen. But at least we were <laughs> mediocre then. At least we were like, oh, these guys have pretty good songs. Now they should get a singer. And then, you know, maybe seven, eight years later, then I figured out how to sing. You know, well, I'm still not a singer. But I can sing kind of in pitch now. 
<laughs> Smelly, you that's, always had that's... you always had chops. What, what was the point where you felt uh, like the band had reached a level of musical competence that uh, you felt happy with? I think 1992. I think about nine years after we were in, we started. I remember the first time we pulled up to Gilman. I mean, we had played Gilman Street. It's, it's a small independent punk club in Berkeley, California. It was sort of a, a, a hub in Northern California. Mm-hmm. It was the place to be. And we'd played there a few times, and, and mostly to half or even less half filled. Yeah, you know, 80, place 80 people was the most we'd ever drawn there. Yeah. It, and, and so I think it was either SM Airlines or Ribbed. We pulled up one night. We drove straight from LA straight to the show, and we pulled up in the van and there was a line around the block and it was sold out. And I think that was probably 91. And that was the first time where I was like, holy crap, you know, like we just sold out a place that a year and a half ago we couldn't even get half filled. Uh, uh, That was a big sense of accomplishment. Yeah. I feel like every band has that. people. 400 people, they like us. (laughs) Yep. And then I went around the corner to McDonald's and shot heroin. Well. uh, Yeah, smelly. (laughs) Well, drugs is a huge uh, Part of this book, uh, Smelly, your addiction to heroin is a big part uh, of the story. Uh, you've been in recovery for many years now, and you go back and tell uh, the story of how that started uh, for you. What was it like to revisit that memory of um, starting on the path to recovery? Well, like I said earlier, like I've dealt with a lot of my demons through, through you know, uh, recovery and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm pretty used to telling that story of of. You know, like in meeting in meetings, tell my story of what ha- where, what I was like and what happened. You know, so it, it wasn't that that hard. That part wasn't hard. Uh, Mike, you were sober at that time. How, how do you remember Smelly's drug use during those tough years? Well, yeah, someone had to keep the boat afloat. So I didn't do drugs till you know till my early thirties is when I tried drugs. But Smelly, to this day, he was the worst drunk drug user I've ever met. I mean, he, he was <laughs> Thanks, just a bud. mess. Yeah, I, I mean, but the thing is, he always played his drums good. And he was always there. He, you know, he never missed a show. He never missed a practice. So what are you going to do? Wow. That you know, and that's how I kind of feel. I'm, I'm not a druggist. I'm not, you know, the other guys in the band had, were at a point where they wanted to kick Smelly out, and they were smoking pot every day. I'm like, you guys can't kick him out for doing heroin while well, you're smoking pot. That's not fair. You know, you're all doing drugs, and I was the one sober. You know, Smelly wasn't, he wasn't a dick. He was he was just a regular guy. Actually, when he did heroin, he used to get kind of peppy. Yeah. It had the opposite effect on him. He would not out. He would he would, he would get awake and get uh, annoying. That's that's strange to hear, the opposite effect. Yeah. You, I mean, you, remember, that's, that's, you remember that too? Absolutely. When, it, when uh, people would say, I'm a trotter, not a nodder. I would like, instead of start nodding out, I would get up and start trotting around the room. It was just, you know, that's like an ADD effect. Downers are like speed, and speed is like a downer for people with ADD. Huh. And he entertained us. He really did. And we would just sit sometimes and watch Smelly go. Because, uh, <laughs> wow. Someone I, told me once that watching me was like, feed the monkey and watch him poop. You know what I mean? Like, just feed me drugs and just watch me go. Well, uh, Mike, yeah. uh, Mike called you the the worst uh, junkie that that uh, he'd ever seen. You write that Courtney Love called you the same thing, the worst junkie she'd ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't so much the amounts that I was doing; it was more of just what a pain in the ass I was. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was I was throwing up all the time. I was just, you know, I was it was just a wreck. I was a twenty two year old wreck. You know, when we go on tour. You can't score heroin when you go to cities because you don't know where to get it. So he would always be uh, with, withdrawing you know, the first day of tour. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was annoying. That would usually take him, <laughs> I don't know, four or five days of him being super grumpy and uh, and sick and just stealing whatever drugs he could, pills or, or and drinking a lot. So, yeah, yeah, it was fun to watch what happened with Smelly. You never knew what was going to happen. He spray painted ten cars, in, you know, with pink spray paint in some neighborhood, just for fun. You know, spray painting anarchy on them or black flag. What were you painting? I don't know. But, I think I was doing uh, stripe, just whatever. I yeah, mean, yeah. you guys are striping you, the cars in the neighborhood. You guys are kind of going with stories back and forth now and laughing about it. Was it was it the same way then? Were you able to laugh about it then? Oh well, yeah. You know, there was a lot of times that, like I mean, yeah, we would. That laugh was on about tour. It. That was in L.A. That was on tour when we could kind of get away with murder. Hmm. Yeah, there was also a lot of times. When I would act up and do do stupid stuff when when I was under the influence when I was drunk and stuff, and then the next day I'd wake up with just this 
impending doom of like, God, I'm such an ass. What the hell is wrong with me? You know, that I couldn't wrap my head around my behavior when I was drunk. And then the, 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 the following night, do the same thing again. So there was like, mm. you know, emotional ups and downs with it for me. Yeah. Well, Smelly- Well, and that's the thing about punk rock that yeah. is great too. You know, you, uh, you can't throw a brick through a window and say, hey, that's country. But you can do you can say that you can you can do that and go that's punk. But it's, uh, a, it's an easy defense sometimes for that yeah, behavior. You can pretty much do anything that that's bad, get in any behavior and just say, well, I'm punk rock. I, I can do that. We're allowed to. I mean, uh, on the serious side, though, I mean, Smelly, you ran with a lot of people who eventually died uh, by overdose or suicide. You reflect on that uh, very fact that you've survived. How do you how do you think that uh, you've made it through? You know, to be honest with you, I don't really know. I mean, I have a good foundation in my recovery and I've surrounded myself with good people, but I have survivor's remorse. I have guilt. Like, why am I the one that was able to get out of that lifestyle and not go to prison or not die? Why am I the lucky one? And then on top of that, why am I the lucky one that is now in a band that is doing really well? Because I see other friends of mine that do get clean and stay clean, but they're still struggling financially and they're still struggling with jobs. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe some mm. some weird divine intervention. I, I don't know, but but I do struggle with this, with the guilt sometimes. Like, you're you're also a really good dude, Smelly. Oh, I mean, thank you, like, buddy. I appreciate you're, that. You're a really big hearted person, as as uh, all the people are in this band, which is what I one of the reasons I think we've been together for so long. And don't fight, because we're all good dudes. Well, yeah, as I said, uh, as I said in the intro, you know, friendship seems to be a big theme in this book. Do you feel like that's part of what's uh, allowed you to survive Absolutely. sure i mean I, I mean if i didn't get along with these guys and i didn't li- love these guys i wouldn't be here you know i mean i would have quit like i quit cost of cost my first band you know mm. what's the point of doing it if i don't enjoy hanging out with the guys that i'm with mike yeah, you, you, same with me yeah, when, when fat records was doing really good uh that was where i was making all my money but i would i would never stop playing in this band because you know because we're all brothers uh, so th- there's friendship. I mean, that's key to survival. Mike, you've also come close to the edge at, at times, and you attribute a lot of your survival to dumb luck uh, in this book. Oh, yeah, C- yeah. Can, can you give an example of that? Uh, well, just L.A., you know, like uh, police were chasing us, macing me and my friends, right? And I didn't get maced, but all my friends did because mm-hmm. I, ran, I ran a little faster. And I come out of a club, and I wouldn't get, I wouldn't get uh, Billy Club to the head. I, uh, I always seem to get out of things. I was surrounded by 10 guys once from this gang and they were coming after me and I somehow I got out of it. I just <laughs> it always seems that I got out of stuff and 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 just like, and no effects being popular just that is such a crazy thought because we were the worst band. We I mean we have to be the most improved band of all time. <laughs> and I, it's just it's pretty crazy that we got as far as we did when none of us really knew what we were doing. And uh, Smelly, would you attest to that, that Mike is a lucky guy? Or do you think it's something more? I think we, we all are, man, because, yeah. you know, we all went through the, the same punk rock scene. And, um, I mean, yeah, I had my scraps with people and I had, you know, and I got clubbed before. But but for all of us just to make it through and be where we are today, it is all luck or dumb luck or, or whatever. Maybe we're no, all not, really. It's not all. I mean, also. Yeah, I know. We, 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 we put made the, the right in. choices. All the way through through the line, I think we've made very good choices in our career. Uh, Smelly, at this point, uh, you're living a sober life in a band that still likes to party. Uh, what is that like yes. for you? It's um, concerning at times. It's frustrating at times, and it's it's. Uh, I got to give them the same respect that they gave me. You know, when I when I was partying, they didn't really get on my on my ass until it was getting when it, until it was beginning to affect the band you know, beginning to affect my playing in the shows and stuff like that. So what I do is is I just kind of keep my distance. I let them do what they're going to do. And because I have a problem with, with myself and that kind of stuff, I it's not fair of me to project it onto them. Mm. You know, they can do what they want to do. And I have a problem with it too, which I'm dealing with now. Bummer. Bum out. You have a, such a good run. Really? Being you, boozy. And, you you kind of decided yeah. that uh, it's time to... Yeah, I, Deal yeah, with I'm some trying to call it off right now. How long has that been going for? Uh, well, I mean, I just got off tour. <laughs> okay. And uh, and it's funny because now I have a guy that travels with me that he holds he holds all the illegal substances, 
and only gives me a little. Huh. And that's that's where I'm at now. Well, yeah. What was what was the uh, d- kind of what made you decide to uh, change course? Uh, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm almost fifty, and a, uh, a lot of my good friends and my bandmates they're just they want me to live. They don't want me to die doing this. And and I and my daughter mostly. You know, after Tony Sly died, uh, I changed my habits, and I'm just changing them more now. It's just you know, there's I can't keep living like this because mm. it it'll end badly. Yeah, it's gonna and and, and I'm going to meet. I went to a meeting yesterday. How was it? It was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm 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 giving it my best shot. Smelly, how does it feel for you to hear that? You know, I'm I'm happy for him, and but I've I've heard him say I'm going to get sober before, or I'm going to try this, or I'm going to try that. So you know, um, you know, I I've heard it. I'm happy that he went. I'm happy that he has a, somebody with him. You know, time will tell. Hmm. I think that's a good attitude, Smelly. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> this is the first time that I'm actually. Re- I've always said I'm going to take a, a break, but it's time for a lifestyle change. Hmm. But you know what, Smelly's right. Six months from now, I'll probably be saying the same crap. <laughs> I mean, as a friend, uh, Smelly, what? How do you? How do you approach uh, helping a friend who's trying to get clean? Well, you can't help somebody unless they're, unless they're willing to get help. I mean, him and I have had talks until I'm blue in the face, at least, you know. Uh, so right now, it's it's at a point for me, for him, for me, it's you know either do it or you know don't or, or you know just, just do something it on it. the pot or get off the pot. Yeah, yeah, do something on the pot or get off the pot. You know, but I've seen how it's beginning to it's catching up with him. It's affecting him physically. It's affecting him emotionally. It's affecting his home life. It's affecting his, you know, parenting life and and business life. You know, so the positives of partying and, and having a good time are definitely being taken over by negatives. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys are both uh, so open in this book about your own lives, but you're also uh, open about uh, some people outside of the band, uh, including close family. Um, Smelly, was there a line for you when it came to deciding what to share and, and what to leave out of this book, especially when it came to uh, other people that you love? Yeah, there was, there. I, you know, I, I kept some stuff out because I don't want to hurt anybody. But at the same time, I did um, open up my soul a lot about my childhood. And I'm really afraid of hurting, like, my dad and my mom. You know, they were just doing the best they could. But it wasn't good enough, you know. Mm-hmm. And and we, we have a really good relationship now. But I have a lot of scars. And they have a, probably a lot of scars. And the last thing I want to do is hurt somebody with honesty because... Uh, like unnecessary pain is it's unnecessary it's not cool <clears throat> but i also wanted to be very honest about my life in this book mm. you know so it's a chance that i took and i'm i'm scared to be honest with you have you talked to your dad smelly since the book came out uh my dad said he's not going to read the book and i told him that whatever negative stuff is in there at the beginning because my whatever negative was in the beginning at the in the end of the book it all wraps up into a nice pretty bow you know about where i'm at now with him but um yeah, it's day to day. Like I talked to my dad on the phone last night and I was afraid that he was going to bring it up. You know, I mean, uh, the last thing I want to do is hurt him. Yeah. You know, uh, you know I because mean, because I'm sure he has, he has enough pain as it is. Well, just to, just to put it in context for our, for our listeners. I mean, you do write about how looking back, you feel like he was cold. You feel like he was uh, psychologically abusive uh, towards you when you were a kid. Um, and your relationship has recovered since then. Yeah, it, it for a long time up until I was probably about forty years old, it was it was pretty strained. You know, I mean, I would see him and I'd talk to him on a, on a shallow basis. I mean, on a shallow level. But now, since I have my daughter, and we're really freaking tight now. It's really weird. It's like we've gotten over this father son weird dynamic to where we could just shoot the sh- shoot the the crap about um you know day to day life. You know. So yeah, it's we're definitely on a very 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 healthy place in a very healthy place right now. What sparked that? Me and my you? parents are doing pretty well too, but you know, dead. <laughs> yeah, because I can't talk back to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mike, you what sparked t- that? Yes. Wait, wait, what, what sparked that? Yeah, the connection, uh, I, reconnection with your father. My daughter. When my, when my daughter came into my life, I adopted this beautiful little girl that came from a troubled house and a troubled family. That my dad also came from the same situation. It really like broke down some of his walls seeing this little seven-year-old girl coming from a crappy uh, situation 
that he was finally able to express love unconditionally towards her, you know? Mm. And so, and then, and that kind of healed our wounds too, you know, it's like, now we have this common thing, this common being that we love and, um, it just, it just soothed, soothed them for some reason. And he's Amazing. a freaking, he's a great grandfather. He was a crappy dad, but he's a great grandfather. When you sat down with the guys and you said, okay, we're going to do this book and it's definitely going to be tell all. Did you know that you were going to include uh, that story? We didn't sit down and say, okay, what are you going to tell? What are you going to tell? You know, we, we didn't bounce the stuff off back and forth. All the interviews were done separately and we just spoke. We just spoke. And then the stories were compiled, you know? So there was no uh, forethought of what's going to be in the book and what's not going to be in the book. And and since the book, you know, I, 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 I me and my wife, have, uh, we talked to a therapist about some things. And the therapist told me something I never even thought of before because I thought it was a neglected child. And, and this lady goes, no, you were abandoned, Mike. Because I, I, I would see my mom maybe two hours a day, and that was it. Wow. And, you know, never at night. You know, I had, when, I was, when I was 12, I had to be home by, you know, 11 o'clock. That was my curfew. You know, it's just like, that's, <laughs> that's how we all ended up in Hollywood, you know, at 2 in the morning when we were 16, 15. Yeah. You know, with, without cars. And it's just, it was a different, it's a different era. And that didn't occur to you uh, really until therapy with your wife? That you were abandoned. Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I didn't see, I didn't see my parents. I never saw my dad, and he told me he didn't want to see me. Wow. A lot of punk rockers, I think that's part of why you get into it because it becomes your chosen family. Well, you guys all start this book with with trauma uh, when you were younger, um, things that probably didn't occur to you at that time. Is that the case uh, for you as well, uh, Smelly? You didn't really realize when you were younger that what you were going through was traumatic. Well, I mean, I knew it was traumatic. I mean, I knew it didn't feel right. I didn't know, if, you know, if it was tra- if there was trauma because that word wasn't in 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 play in the house. Yeah. But as I got older, uh, and I could look back at things, I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute!" But while while I was involved, it was just like, "Oh, my house sucks. I don't like being here." You know, I didn't know, and it was I didn't know it it was an abusive house because I had nothing else to base it off of. Do you agree with what Mike said that that's a kind of a common denominator for a lot of uh, a lot of kids in your scene? Um, Absolutely. And that's why, you know, you said earlier, why didn't we just leave? Because it was our scene. There's the good kids and there was bad kids, but it was still our scene. It was it was more than just music, you know? So, yeah, that was definitely a common denominator. I mean, people say it, say this, it's cliche, but punk rock saved my life. It totally did. Look, you know, who knows what I would have been doing. Well, it's and, uh, it's an incredible book, man. I'm not gonna lie. Like in this job, I read a lot of uh, read, read a lot of books, read a lot of, of memoirs, and and this one stands out. Oh, awesome! Well, thank you you know, it's, it's really weird too. It's, like Mike said earlier, like people didn't really they only know us if it's like as like an, uh, a '90s melodic punk band. It's like we started a decade before that, and there's all this this life and craziness and anarchy and all this stuff that's people don't even understand what it what what life was like back then for kids like us. Mm. And there's no, I don't think there's another book like this. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of bands like important. Motley Crue and all that other stuff, they put out stuff just kind of boasting their egos and boasting about, you know, all their accolades. What we're doing is we're actually breaking it down to individuals and pain and life and, and what people go through, you know. We're showing people that we're, we're not just some band flying around in private jets and having a good time in our five-star hotels, you know. It's like, no, we're freaking, we're four people that have all gone through things. Mm. And you're still here. And de- yeah. And still and together. It wasn't overnight success. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good no day. Have a good day. Later. Cool.